Today our session is on disruption with impact, the intersection of business and philanthropy, and we have two terrific people to tackle this critical issue. I've known Professor Carolyn Elkins for about 10 years now. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning professor and founding director of Harvard Center for African Studies. At Harvard Business School, she's created and teaches the short intensive program, Africa Rising, understanding business entrepreneurship and the complexities of the continent. And she's also the course head for the MBA Field Global Immersion Program. She's also led Harvard Business School students in global immersions to Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and Tanzania, and she serves on multiple foundation and corporate boards in Africa. Carrie, thank you so much for partnering with Africa.com for this session today and for inviting your colleague, Dr. James Mwangi, to join us today. Now, while James is here today, clearly at Carrie's invitation, I had the privilege of meeting James several years ago when we were both participants in a four-day working seminar about of among about a dozen people on financial inclusion in Africa, which was hosted by MasterCard. And in the course of four days with about a dozen people, you get a chance to get to know people. And that particular session brought together business leaders from across the continent to talk about how various private sector companies in the finance sector could expand their businesses to include the bottom of the pyramid, to bank the unbanked, those who have not had access to financial services, um, it was very clear among that group that James was a leader among leaders. It was clear that his work at Equity Bank is about more than just making money and that he has a very deep understanding and long track record in serving the poor. He has numerous awards, numerous honorary degrees, a list too long for us to go through today or we would spend the entire session walking through his CV and his biography. You can read about him on our website if you would like to know more. He is a celebrity CEO who needs no further introduction. And so now I'm going to turn this session over to the very able hands of Professor Carolyn Elkins. Carrie? Thank you so much, Teresa. And first, may I also begin in, in thanking you for such generous introductions and also for inviting James and me here today. Africa.com and your entire team has, has really established what is the flagship webinar series on COVID, not just for Africa, but for the rest of the world. And it's truly an honor and privilege to be here, um, both as your friend and colleague, and also somebody who so admires all that you and your team have, have accomplished in such a short period of time. Um, and James, Welcome. It is such an honor to be here with you as well. Frankly, just a joy. Uh, you and I have been friends now for a long time, and it's, uh, I think it's just a wonderful opportunity for us to, to have a conversation and to talk a little bit about um, various aspects of your work. Uh, we will then, we'll sort of move through some of your background, as Teresa gestured to. Um, you have an extraordinary background, and one that informs an ethos um, uh, that, is, that is truly the North Star to you, James, in your life, in, in the bank, in the foundation. Uh, we'll move on to a few questions about the current COVID crisis, and then I'm going to ask you after that to take out your seasoned uh, crystal ball that is filled with wisdom and to offer us some, some insights in terms of your thinking in, in the long term. We'll then move to, back to Teresa for some questions and answers. And then you and I will return for a final uh, a few words um, before we wrap up the session. So most of all, James, welcome today. Thank you very much, Professor Carter. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So James, let's jump in a little bit into your background because, <clears throat> you know, in, as Teresa said, I, I could sit here and sort of rattle off all the various accolades and frankly, um, you're, 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 you're so humble about all of them. And so let me just gesture to a few. And in 2019, you were selected to the prestigious Bloomberg 50 and Africa Business Magazine called you the most successful banker in modern African history. And I've also heard from more than one person that your life story is stranger than fiction. So what I'd like is perhaps you can just tell us a bit about your background and how you have grown to be the, the James that you are today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, 42 years ago, I entered uh, high school without shoes. That spoke a lot about how my life, early life was. I'd lost... Uh, my father to the freedom struggle uh, in Kenya. And my mother was left with uh, seven kids to bring up. My mother had not gone to school, of course. Mm -hmm. And as you can see uh, uh, on the image there, uh, the young tall man, that was James Mwangi uh, mm -hmm. then. 
and with my sibling sisters. And that is uh, the Bakker girl. And, I, I, and of course, uh, my mother taught us about um, making a living from our work, the work of our hearts. And I had to burn and uh, charcoal, I had to bed uh, vegetables and um, fruits and milk to really support uh, the family. And so when you look at that, uh, that's what most people call the fiction. But truly that uh, is the reality of a majority of uh, young kids in uh, Lulo, Kenya. But then it speaks a lot about the possibilities that we have of mm -hmm. changing lives and livelihoods and mm -hmm. looking for pathways to help people. Mm. No, and I think that, that, that ethos, James, changing lives and livelihoods is one that I so associate with you and the work that you've done. And in some ways, it also speaks to when we think about careers, all of us, we think about these key decision making points that we make, right? And, and you had one in 1991. You left a very prestigious, um, I think one could say lucrative job to join what was at that time a nearly insolvent building society. And some said this was a risky move. I've read other people who said that that was a foolish move. What was James thinking? Um, and But you've now transformed that building society into a leading bank and have built this bank, Equity, um, on the ethos of banking the unbanked. Um, can you tell us more about that ethos and how that drove your decision-making process in, 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 in building the bank that it is today? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I may pick out uh, two lessons that uh, my mother taught me. Uh, she taught me that um, uh, there is no wealth without hard work. And if I ever wanted to make it, uh, one thing that uh, then I have to appreciate was uh, that I had to work the entire of my life. The second uh, was um, the belief that she, she had uh, that uh, as an orphan, uh, without somebody to protect me, the only uh, person who could protect me was myself uh, by clothing myself with the values and uh, uh, living a life, an ethical life so that I'm protected uh, from uh, uh, law. And essentially those are the, uh, the traits that brought up and made me seek a, a life of a purpose. And mm -hmm. consequently, I left a job that was paying me 360,000 uh, to go and earn uh, 60,000 shillings, a, third, uh, a sixth of what uh, I was earning. But looking back today, we can see the impact that we have had in society. We have mm -hmm. brought honor and dignity to banking. We have given banking a, a human face we have given it a soul, and essentially we have disrupted it and democratized it. And that is the reward of that uh, huge um, uh, sacrifice. It's no mm -hmm. sacrifice, no gain. So mm -hmm. that, that is really the story. But uh, the real transformation, uh, Professor, was out of the fact that uh, we realized that what people required most beyond financial services was to be treated with honor and with the dignity and with the respect. That is a basic requirement of everybody. And in a business that provides that, the way it interacts with its customers, uh, then uh, it's always rewarded massively because that is principally lacking. And truly that is the basis of the success of equity. Lastly, let me say, we then uh, took uh, the values that my mother had brought, uh, brought me up and we made them the core values of equity group. So if you look at the values, they are just human values. They are not uh, banking values. It's really the human values of interactions and relationships. And then the cause of living a purpose, we made it uh, uh, the corporate philosophies uh, of the bank, changing mm -hmm. lives and empowering entrepreneurs to create wealth. That is the interaction and the learning from that past. Uh, and maybe as they say, uh, necessity is the mother of innovations. My circumstances and situation shaped the rest of my life mm -hmm. and keep on speaking to be to date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's extraordinary, James. And I think the, you know, you spoke the language of financial inclusion before that was au courant, so to speak, right? You, you know, the banking the unbanked. And, you know, for you in particular, what, you know, what does that mean, banking the unbanked? Um, please go ahead. Kale had lived a life uh, of exclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, my entire village, there was nobody who had a bank account. 
So mm -hmm. it was not just financial inclusion, uh, exclusion. It was economic exclusion. It was social uh, exclusion. So, mm -hmm. and once you are excluded, you are condemned to your status and circumstances for the rest of your life. And so we needed to break that barrier uh, mm -hmm. by bringing social, economic, financial inclusion into the village. And so equity was about uh, banking my mother Grace as she was. Uh, 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 my mother had never gone to formal school. Uh, she had no modern economic activity she was uh, uh, engaged in, but I knew she kept a little bit of her money at her mattress. And occasionally when she thought there was a risk, she could put it in a tin and bury it under the banana stem. And the question is, how could I bring dignity and honor in the life of my mother? And that is, can I include my mother? Can we make my mother to be included? And in the process of including my mother, I included all the women and the uh, population that was like her. And in total at that time, 96% of the entire population had been excluded. Only 4% of the population had access to financial services. Without uh, access to financial services, you are not on the table where resources are allocated. And without resources being allocated to you, your dreams are condemned as not valid. Yet we know all dreams are valid if empowered. Mm. And it's extraordinary, James, and in the way in which the thread, the impact of your mother, Grace, on your life, um, all the way through and all the way down to today. And you know, when I think about that, the that 4% number is staggering. Ballpark approximately, how many, how many Kenyans are banked today? 86% with 60% of the entire bank population being in equity. It became a movement of socioeconomic transformation. Hmm. Those are incredible numbers, James. Absolutely staggering. And, you know, I, I want to I think about those numbers. And because one could, you could have just stopped there, right? But you didn't. Instead, you, in 2008, um, you decided to start Equity Group Foundation. And what role, in your mind, can a corporate foundation play in transforming livelihoods and in, 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 in taking the same ethos that drove the bank and, and now taking to the foundation? By 2009, we have moved from a technically insolvent uh, building society to one of the, the leading banks uh, uh, in the country. And I realized we had enough resources that we could share uh, with the society and community uh, than we could do through corporate social responsibility. We needed a specialized vehicle uh, mm -hmm. that could host and uh, bring collaboration with like-minded people to have impact. And this was out of the realization that we had two licenses. There was a business license that we had been given by Central Bank to do banking. But there was an operating license that we were given by the citizens by walking through uh, our doors and opening accounts with us and consuming our products. And that license, I felt, we owed duty uh, to align public good with what we were doing as an institution. And I thought that we could mold the, uh, the bank uh, to have the business model of the bank uh, to focus on shared prosperity. There's prosperity for the shareholders, uh, for the staff and lenders and depositors, but there's prosperity for society. There's mm -hmm. prosperity for community and uh, the public in general. And that was what we called the social arm by forming Equity Group Foundation. Mm -hmm. Equity Group Foundation focuses on that which the commercial region, uh, the, uh, uh, the enterprise, cannot do. The enterprise does those things that uh, it's licensed. And basically, if I may just say one or two things that uh, the foundation does best, Please. is to build capacity on the population and the public so that they can use the tools available in society to transform their lives. Those tools make it even more possible for them uh, than to be included, not just uh, socially, not such uh, economically and financially, but in all the limbs of enjoyment of uh, society. Mm -hmm. The second one is really to build the bridge and the bridges, if I may say, uh, that so James Mwangi moved from uh, uh, the village to become who he is. 
we needed that bridge to be structurally maintained. And part of it is uh, the, uh, the scholarship stories of Wings to Fry. We needed to give scholarships to orphans than James Mwangi so they can become the next James Mwangi. We needed to look at my mother and, uh, the, uh, and uh, her children burning charcoal, bedding vegetables and milk so as to work living. We needed to train them better practices. And that is the basis of financial literacy. That is the basis of uh, entrepreneurship uh, training. And we have done them in scale simply because then we created a reliable, dependable platform of uh, social intervention that like-minded people like MasterCard Foundation could jump in and scale. DFI, USID, that is what the foundation was all about. Scaling the impact and, uh, and more importantly, institutionalizing our business model of shared prosperity and mm -hmm. social uh, impact investments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's quite something, James. We're going to come back. I'm going to come back to you as we move into the current COVID crisis. But the, the scope of your foundation, um, education, you mentioned Wings to Fly, um, healthcare, entrepreneurship, alternative energy, agriculture, um, really sort of the, the capillaries of life in the ways in which as you, as you sort of to mix metaphors a little bit, you gesture to sort of the building of bridges. And, and we're gonna come back to some of these specifics when we, as we move into the current COVID crisis and, and thinking about the role of private business and, and foundations in particular um, with the crisis and its evolution, its impact. So let me ask you the big picture question, James. How big is this current crisis? Um, how big is the current evolving COVID crisis been to Kenya, to East Africa, to the continent at large? Let's first of all look at it globally. Uh, the COVID crisis, uh, the World Bank has said is uh, as big as the global financial crisis uh, or the Great Depression of uh, the 1930s. That's mm. how big it is. If you look at the amount of resources uh, that has been uh, uh, spent to stimulate uh, the global economy, they amount to $11 trillion. But if mm. you look at the total sum of loss of the wealth or the GDP of the world, it has lost $12 trillion, almost a similar amount uh, despite Let's come back, uh, down to Africa. We have seen uh, the opportunities that have been lost uh, by the continent because of disruption of global supply chains. They've really been heavily disrupted. And we have uh, awoken to the realization that we are very, very dependent to globalization. Um, uh, the second thing is that um, the nurturing uh, institutions have also been disrupted. Let's look at our education. In Kenya, uh, the 2020 has been declared as a lost uh, year uh, for, uh, in terms of education. A whole year without children going to school. We have also realized that the governments have focused on nothing else other than health. Kenya has already laid out two uh, supplementary budgets, all geared to uh, the pandemic. What have we, uh, if we look at the health sector particularly, you see the health sector, all the resources are about COVID and we have forgotten there were existing uh, diseases, diseases that are now ravaging uh, uh, the population and, and making COVID uh, uh, infected people greatly uh, prone uh, to the risk uh, because then they have pre-existing conditions. That is the impact that it has. But look at our commodities. Our commodities, most of them have lost uh, uh, market. So essentially, we are seeing, for instance, the African continent. It's on record that after 25 years of progressive development, it will experience a recession. That is how big this uh, COVID situation is. And worse, it is made that it's not just a health uh, uh, pandemic, it has mutated. Uh, to become a social uh, crisis, a humanitarian crisis in the sense that uh, lockdown has disrupted um, the economic opportunities. So yeah. it's a human tragedy, if I may use that word, uh, Professor. Yes, I mean, I think the, James, I think that you're giving us a, a sense of the enormity, not just in terms of broad brushstrokes, but by some, some, some absolute specifics. And I want, I want to sort of move towards one particular aspect in the cascading effects of, of the 
the crisis, which is enormous by, by any standard as you're, you're gesturing to. And, you know, in some ways, nobody would be surprised <clears throat> to know that you sit on the president's task force for, for COVID response. But some people might be surprised to know that you chair the health working group. Why, why is a banker chairing the health working group? <laughs> help, help me understand that better. Uh, thank you uh, very much. This is a crisis, and a crisis requires uh, leaders who have dealt with the crisis before. Mm -hmm. As you likely said, I had uh, in my heart a crisis in uh, uh, early childhood, mm -hmm. and a crisis converting a technically insolvent uh, building society to what equity is. Mm -hmm. And recently, as uh, a banker, I went through the a global financial crisis and mm -hmm. still the bank. And uh, two years ago, three years ago, we were dealing with the interest capping crisis. So maybe that's what the president uh, saw and my colleagues that uh, what we needed, uh, needed is leaders who can deal with the crisis. And crisis management was the leadership style that was most required. The second aspect, of course, is that um, this crisis didn't require necessarily medics alone. As we said, uh, it's a multifaceted, uh, mm -hmm. multidimensional crisis. So what it really required is big picture leaders. And I had the privilege uh, for the, a long time, almost uh, 17 years, uh, leading the National uh, Aspiration Vision 2030, the long-term national strategic plan. And I've also served as a chancellor of uh, one of our universities of science and technology. And that gave me the experience, together with my 30 years of leadership in Equity Bank, uh, maybe to be um, bestowed with the honor of rising up when society needed leadership most. Mm. Now, it's, it's, I think what you're describing too, James, is, is the degree to which not just your your own personal history, but your professional history with crisis management, and how does one take challenges and render them into opportunity? And one of the things that has sort of struck me is the fact that, and maybe you can speak to this a little more, that um, Kenya is now no longer importing PPE, and you are chairing that group. How did that happen? Uh, when I was appointed the chair of uh, the health committee, we analyzed quickly uh, pandemics and we realized and we did uh, studies of pandemics that have occurred over the last one uh, uh, thousand two hundred years and we realized one thing that pandemics uh, really sometimes can drag themselves and have significant impact impact then we quickly scanned the world and say where is the solution likely to come from and essentially the prescription uh, uh, that has been given uh, or the protocols that we had been given was all about wearing masks, it was all about PPEs. And then we realized that global supply chains had been disrupted. So the entrepreneur in me uh, recommended that maybe the best we could do uh, was to convert the crisis into an opportunity and make Kenya a hub, a regional hub for PPE production. And I'm really glad and proud to say we now have seven factories uh, that have really focused uh, on uh, manufacturing um, PPEs. And uh, we have uh, about uh, $14 million uh, of PPEs in the pipeline, all produced within the country. And that gave us control of uh, the supply chain. It uh, gave us uh, control of timelines. But more importantly, it helped us uh, to uh, position the country uh, in a more diversified way. Uh, mm -hmm. to manufacture medical and health equipment. And we have so far got all the jobs of those factories uh, retained. And in addition, 3,700 jobs have been added. And now we have started uh, exporting PPEs in the region. It's extraordinary, James, and all within two to three months. Um, two months, uh, Kerry. Extraordinary. And I want to I wanna build on this point, James, because and sort of take it more broadly in thinking about, you know, how can private, the private sector collaborate with each other and how can they sort of complement um, the government to address certain challenges of COVID-19? I know these are extraordinary times and sometimes, uh, as they say, rivals suddenly become a team of rivals. And so perhaps you can speak to that a little bit in the context of Kenya. 
I think the private sector itself first does need to start collaborating before even partnering with the government. And I'm really glad uh, that uh, the COVID initiative in Kenya has brought out uh, the industry captains uh, that uh, we all compete to make money. Uh, three banks are there, uh, telecoms, Abua, uh, and essentially when we sit together, I see the benefits of diversity and uh, the trash that comes out of, uh, out of it, the brain power that comes with it. But truly when a nation is in a crisis, it behooves everybody to play their role. And that is the, uh, the genesis of then uh, elaborate collaboration between mm -hmm. government, uh, private sector, and citizen. If you mm -hmm. look at uh, the COVID fight, uh, it was seeded, uh, the funding was seeded by my family, eventually with $4 million. The bank matched that with uh, uh, $4 million. And the nation lost. Today we have... Um, a total of 2.7 billion Kenya shillings. Out of that, MasterCard jumped in a long-term partner and gave us 500. As you can see, the private sector on its own is now able to defend and protect the frontline medical staff fighting COVID. Without, uh, and then the government then can focus on the patients. The government now is able to build 400 to 500 bed hospitals in each of our 47 counties. That collaboration is what uh, brings speed, efficiency into a solution. And mm -hmm. the last one is to say uh, the collaboration between public and private sector inspires the public and lulls the public uh, to, uh, to the realization that they also have to play a part. So I see the Kenyan population have responded to this gesture of private government uh, mm. collaboration by also collaborating, by observing the protocols that have been issued by the Ministry of Health. Mm. It's incredible, James, and, and truly a model, a potential model for other countries on the continent, and, and, and I dare say for around the world. I, I know that the country in which I'm living right now could certainly take a, a leaf from the playbook um, that you and others are, 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 are uh, executing right now in Kenya. And, you know, sort of, again, to sort of take this one step further and bring it to foundations, what, if we think about sort of what the private sector is doing with the government right now, what, what, kind, what unique role can a foundation play in addressing the current COVID crisis? I think, uh, given what we said, that uh, uh, business have two licenses. Uh, the license uh, issued by the regulator and the public uh, license. Businesses need them to, to have two components of them, the social license and the commercial license. And the foundations, uh, particularly corporate foundations, are powerful vehicles uh, in transforming philanthropy and in innovating and reimagining philanthropy. One, all corporates have dead assets, whether it is the human capital that they pay for every month, whether it's the infrastructure that like the data uh, center and data capability and IT capability of equity, the branch network, the agent, which can be put at the disposal of foundation for free to deliver uh, good to society. And then you can then say a con an organization is doing uh, well while still doing good without incurring any additional cost. The second aspect is um, uh, co uh, foundations bring in um, the corporate uh, capabilities, whether it's human capabilities, governance capability, technology capabilities, and they can't live up and they can't compete with NGOs. They are massive, they have the size, the capability. And lastly, what is most important is for the foundation to be stronger in terms of um, leeway to force the commercial entity to embed the concept of shared prosperity in its business model. You mm -hmm. ensure that it becomes the DNA of uh, the corporate enterprise. The foundation doesn't need leader to, to be executing. It should be executing through uh, the corporate arm. And in uh, executing through the, co uh, the corporate uh, arm, uh, then it saves a lot of cost. The products of the enterprise, uh, the services of the enterprise should be uh, dual built, built with a social component and a commercial component. 
And so then we then achieve scale, and more importantly, we achieve sustainability because mm -hmm. it's em embedded in the business model. To me, that's what uh, Equity Group Foundation have done. And uh, I can see, um, ag arguably, that uh, the foundation is said to have a bigger social impact than the commercial impact of the mm -hmm. entire group. Mm -hmm. Whether it is in education, whether it's in health, whether it's in agriculture where it has transformed the peasant farmers into agribusinesses, whether it is in education, whether it is in innovations, all these, and yet they're embedded in the products. Whether mm -hmm. it's group life insurance, whether it's group health insurance, for the entire country, uh, they are carried through or they paid up infrastructure. Mm. It's amazing. What I hear from you, James, is a, a few things here. One, the foundations of the ability to scale, but also I think coming back almost to some of the beginning points in our conversation, and that is the, the corporate arm and the foundation must be sort of two sides of the, uh, of the same ethical coin. And thinking about the sort of bringing dignity to banking, uh, changing lives, and the ways in which the foundation can do many things that the corporate arm cannot, but yet it's that sort of the banner of the overriding principle driving you and driving Equity Group Foundation, and, and I would dare say other foundations around the continent that really have to be front and center. Um, is that a fair assessment? Uh, I think I agree with you entirely. And the uh, only thing I can add is that uh, when you combine a strong corporate and a uh, foundation, and a powerful commercial enterprise. The commercial enterprise uh, becomes the heart of the group, mm. while the foundation becomes the soul mm. and the face. And of course, the enterprise also becomes the brain. So you really have a, a, um, a personality uh, who has a brain, who has a, a heart, who has a soul, and has a face. And essentially, then what will really happen is you align with the community. The non-commercial interests uh, of, uh, of the community are carried along by the foundation. And that is what really uh, creates uh, loyalty. That's what creates blood. That's what creates uh, coherence uh, in alignment with the culture of uh, the community. Because those all things cannot be done within a, a commercial enterprise but they can comfortably be carried along uh, by, and then embed uh, public good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then assures the, the population that their license is appreciated and valued by the enterprise operating within its uh, community. I like to, these are such crucial points, James. And in the last, we've got about another five to seven minutes before I turn it over to Teresa. And so I want to sort of quickly drill down on sort of some particular constituents and then I'm going to ask you to sort of open up and sort of look at that crystal ball for us in the last five minutes. But um, perhaps you can speak a little bit to, you know, the World Bank projects that in Sub-Saharan Africa, the popul population is going to double by 2050 uh, to uh, more than 2 billion. This is often referred to as uh, the youth bulge, and at the same time, what we know, what you just described, and that is, for the first time in 25 years, Africa is um, experiencing recession. How do we read both of these on the same page? And how, you know, what words do you have and ideas uh, do you have for Africa's youth right now? And, and, and where, you know, what's going to happen uh, going forward as we move through this COVID crisis? I think uh, the World Bank is holding a mirror to our leaders to see uh, the kind of leadership that is required. On one hand, uh, um, a recession, uh, when population is almost uh, doubling uh, within a period of 25 years, uh, means um, uh, reduced opportunities. Uh, and what the impatient youth require most is opportunities to work a living. Uh, so this situation has two aspects to it. Mm -hmm. The first one, is our leaders converting it uh, into a major uh, sort of uh, uh, demographic dividend. Mm -hmm. By ensuring we are, we are investing um, into our youth. And for me, I would say uh, to our leaders that the COVID situation might be a turning point. Uh, mm -hmm. While the world has been disrupted, there is a vacuum that Africa can quickly fill 
in that bracket. Uh, as you saw, Kenya has reversed uh, uh, the supply chain uh, of PPEs from an, uh, an import to an export value chain. That is only employed. The people we are talking about being employed is the youth. That opportunity exists of recalibrating the world uh, as we know it, the landscape of the world. But then we have to have the right policy and we must uh, do the right uh, investment. Some of the right investment is particularly on innovation space. How can we get our young people to focus on innovations, uh, particularly on online businesses? Mm -hmm. Businesses that doesn't require movement of people, uh, uh, businesses that doesn't require social interaction, and uh, businesses that allow virtual operation. Mm -hmm. That is a huge opportunity. And given that Africa has been lagging behind uh, in, uh, in industrialization, it means its response time is much faster because the rest of the world is converting legacy systems. They have sunk the cost, they have loans and the rest. So that is one great opportunity. If that opportunity is lost, uh, then we are inviting a second Arab Spring uh, on the continent where mm -hmm. the youth becomes impatient, where the youth refuse uh, to be read in a manner that doesn't provide hope uh, to them and that doesn't tap into their talent. But then it's not just the government. I think the private sector uh, can play a very significant role. Uh, one, in investing in research and development uh, so that uh, we can really engage. The second one, in transfer of technology and engaging uh, the youth. And lastly, in building the youth's capacity to mm. make them ready for the opportunities that are on the uh, on the horizon. Mm. Mm. No, it's. I mean, I, I. What I love, James, about your thinking is not only are you spot on, but you have a plan, <laughs> and sort of thinking about sort of it's not just that we have a problem to address, but how do we address that? And I'd like to sort of move to. We have two sort of last. Well, before you move, I think it's good you said that with Mastercard Foundation, we have embarked on. Uh, a program that we are calling uh, Young Africa Works, mm -hmm. uh, with the target of building 30 million decent jobs that gives dignity and honor to our young people. And we have taken the lead in Kenya uh, to really create those 5 million jobs. And so it can be done, Professor. Mm. No, absolutely. And I think the, and, and sort of building on that point, James, you know, we've talked about on the, on the entrepreneurship, side but also um education what's what is what is school going to look like in kenya and, and in east africa and in general post covid on the continent uh i think there's nothing that lila wallace me uh like uh, the education of young people uh it is education uh, that was my bridge of transformation if i didn't get uh, the education the quality education i got maybe i would still be burning charcoal in the village Maybe, maybe I could have been even been demoted more uh, to digging pit latrines for people in the village. But because of the education, here I am, I'm speaking to a Harvard professor um, on uh, this webinar uh, to the whole world. That must be guaranteed to every child. It must be a light to every. Education has been disrupted. Why? Because it was constructed with the physical infrastructure in mind. So in physical infrastructure, infrastructure that became public, such that, uh, and we are telling everybody to keep away from public places. We're telling everybody uh, to wear a mask. We are telling everybody to do social distancing, which is not possible in a public entity. So essentially what we need to do is to reform our education system. It is very sad for 20 million kids in Kenya to have lost an entire year. And that may be something we'll live with for a very long time. The mm -hmm. social impact, the psychological impact of telling a child to repeat a year uh, is uh, maybe unquantified. So mm -hmm. to, another process, one, is that we should invest uh, substantially on online education to mm -hmm. try and avert, because we don't know when we will get the vaccine. The terrestrial infrastructure should support that need to be put in place. And that should be a priority of government the way it has prioritized health. 
uh, because we, if we don't invest in the youth, we'll be very busy destroying our future. So mm -hmm. it is, it's an imperative. The second, uh, of course, is really the question of uh, seeing whether virtual learning can be complemented uh, by different uh, education models, not necessarily uh, digitizing the traditional curriculums and models. This is an opportunity for us to ask the relevant, they ask the difficult question about the relevance of education uh, mm -hmm. to, to the future uh, job market. And then we take advantage of that. And because uh, we have been forced to make the decisions, we make the light turn. And mm -hmm. then history will judge us uh, uh, favorably instead of uh, charge, uh, judging us harshly if, mm. uh, by missing that opportunity. Mm. I appreciate your candor with these responses, James. Um, and as I said, it's a combination of, of such, such decades of informed leadership and crisis management and also bringing to that a kind of ethos, um, an ethical compass that's about transforming not just lives and societies, but countries, nations, regions, a continent. And so I could sit here and ask questions all afternoon with you um, because I'm just enjoying my time, but I know that's, that's rather selfish. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Teresa, who's going to moderate some Q&A with the audience. And at which point I will then come back and you and I have a few moments to chat. Um, so thank you, James, and I'm going to turn it now over to Teresa. I uh, thank you, Carla. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that discussion. That was quite inspiring, and I appreciate learning so much more about you, James. The first person that we have is Nongfei Kanka, who is here from South Africa, and she is the chair of the Chief Albert Lutuli Foundation, also the chair of the National Foundations Dialogue Initiative in South Africa, Noam Clay. Thank you so much, Teresa. And um, Dr. Mugabe, it's such a pleasure to, uh, to, to meet you and to, to hear your story. It's, it's quite inspiring for those of us that are involved in, in social development. And this, um, I think at this time, given your life's commitment, um, one can definitely say that the campaigns that are going on around the world in terms of Build Back Better, uh, that is certainly a testament uh, and an acknowledgement um, that finding that, that sweet spot uh, is, is important. And um, it is actually the, the highest form of flattery. I think we are all trying to emulate, uh, imitate the way that you've lived your life. Um, so my question, given that, is if we want to clone uh, more people like you and you were responsible for creating a, um, a, a crash course in ethical business leadership, what are some of the three or four subject models that you would put in your syllabus? What should one focus on if we wanted to create and clone youth? Ah, thank you very much for an excellent question. I think uh, I would take the lessons that I was taught uh, by uh, my mother about uh, ethical business. My mother believed uh, that uh, the greatest aspect of business is in its leadership. And leadership because leadership bring ethics. She kept on constantly telling me that as I deliver milk to the restaurant, I should never be tempted uh, to add more water so that I can be able to deliver higher quantity. Because that she told me, you lose the loyalty of the restaurant where you supply milk. And two, it will speak of your values and uh, it will you'll be looked down upon uh, by society. So ethical leadership would be maybe my first uh, subject because uh, lanes rise and fall uh, with leadership. And no enterprise can be better than its leader. All enterprises are a mirror image of their leaders. The second thing I would focus on is the issue of the business model. And a leader could uh, teach uh, uh, about business model uh, that um, embeds uh, philanthropy in form of shared prosperity. I would really teach of a business model that respects the legal license 
but also respects uh, of the social license. It is society that gives us the license to operate by patronizing our business. That license cannot be for free. And essentially it can be done either by shared prosperity, impact investment, uh, or sort of approach. And the third and most important uh, thing maybe I could really talk about uh, is uh, communication uh, that uh, is geared towards stakeholder management. A leadership should be honest and transparent with its communication to our stakeholders uh, without disregarding uh, particularly the community and the society. They are a major stakeholder and issuers of the social license. So that communication aspect uh, should be really, really central. And of course, if I was given a chance to add uh, a fourth module, uh, I would really focus on sustainability, the preservation of the environment, that uh, that um, business model should have um, a triple bottom line. It should focus on people, that is customers, employees, shareholders, and all that kind, and then it should focus on environment as a very important component because of sustainability. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wangi. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and our next question comes from Michael Matika. Michael is a Kenyan um, living in the diaspora in the UK at this time. He is the immediate past president of Vision Fund International which is a global financial inclusion arm of World Vision. And Michael is returning home to Kenya, as I understand it now, to found InGrow Advisory as a managing partner to have more impact back home in Kenya. Michael? Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Teresa. Dr. James Wangi, it's wonderful to see you <laughs> after so many years and just hearing your story, your passion is the one thing that is consistent. And um, I think the work you're doing, you know, we sing praises all over the world. And it's excellent. Thank you, Michael. I, I really have um, something that I want to focus on, James, and this is innovation. Um, you know, as Teresa says, I, I'm packing my bags, heading back home, um, really to focus on this space around innovation. And when we look at what we've seen and in Africa, and I think what you've achieved with um, with Equity Group, it's all about innovation. You know, the most successful, the most valuable companies in East Africa, Safaricom, Equity, are the most innovative companies. And, and you know, our session today is on disruptive impact. What can we do or what else can the foundation do to, in a way, not to use your words, to democratize innovation? I, I think you know, you've talked about the business model innovation, you've talked about taking different ways of approaching things um, so that the end result is shared prosperity. Um, what in your view can the corporates like Equity and the foundation do to encourage and just catalyze greater innovation across the continent? Oh, thank you very much, Michael. And really it's a pleasure meeting you on this web today. And most welcome back home. We need the skills and experiences mm -hmm. that uh, you can bring home. I think uh, truly innovation is the hallmark of our transformation. We're not going to transform, uh, we are not going to transform the continent if we don't embrace transformation. The things we have done over the last 60, 65 years of our independence haven't given us the quality of life uh, mm -hmm. that we deserve uh, as, um, as a continent. So we must ask ourselves, where did we go wrong? And as we answer that question, that will spark the innovations that require, are required um, in the continent. Yes, we can cut and paste uh, innovations that have worked, but they may not work necessarily in our circumstances. So let's solve our problems. There is a myriad of uh, problems uh, in Africa. I don't see them as problems. I see them as opportunities to unlock because business enterprise is providing a solution to an existing pro uh, uh, problem that society is willing to pay for, to solve. And so all those challenges represent, but they can't be solved the way they have been solved over the last 60 years. They must be solved differently. 
And Michael, you can come back uh, with a solution on how to solve uh, the problem of education, how we can virtualize our education, how maybe we can make our education online. That you can imagine how much uh, resources it could because it will, you don't have a monopoly uh, business uh, uh, on the continent. So <laughs> the issue of innovation. Now let's go to the foundation and equity. I believe we can play a catalytic role. And what we have done at the moment uh, is to form FINSA as an, uh, a hub for innovation. And basically to support um, the community and particularly the young people. What we have done is to expose the APIs of uh, the entire group, such that young people develop solutions and plug and play uh, to our APIs. They don't have really to invest. And as much as possible, we are doing uh, that for free. The second uh, thing we are doing is to uh, uh, sponsor a lot of workshops to young people on the how. They know what, but on the how. And essentially, we are using our IT skills and competences uh, of our staff and say, why don't you give back to society by guiding young people? We're now forcing our top executives, we have about eight who are at PhD level, uh, to team up with the University of Nairobi. We have taken uh, the um, uh, dean of uh, the School of IT Innovations of University on the bank and asked them to tap into the resources of the bank and take them to the University of Nairobi so that we can be catalyst. Lastly, is like what uh, we did with Meru University of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. Give a grant, a one million grant uh, to the university and say, set an innovation hub. And I'm very impressed with what I see when I go to Meru University of Science and Technology, innovation hub. Uh, and what is coming out of that. The last one is we must set a path for commercializing innovations. The biggest problem is commercializing innovations. And uh, we have developed an entrepreneurship program for innovators. We have 54,000 of them now. And what we are doing is to attach them to the business owners or to the practicing entrepreneurs for coaching and mentoring. Because it's one great idea to have an innovation, it's another one to take it to the market, Michael. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mungi. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are now going to go to David Soman. Um, David is calling in from London. He is the chairman of Eldama Technologies in Kenya and the managing director of virtual IT in London. David? Thank you, Teresa, and hello, James. Nice to see you. Uh, thanks for, um, as always, the uh, inspiring talk. Um, I wanted actually to come back a little to the subject of, of COVID and just get some thoughts for you as applied to Kenya and also to Africa. I mean, there's obviously a very delicate balance between um, restricting movement and keeping social distancing in order to save lives and at the same time starting to allow a reasonable opening of movement and, and circulation to re-stimulate the economy. Um, and in Europe, um, the, there's been quite a move towards more opening up. And it looks like in Kenya, as an example, that's starting to cautiously follow. Um, and I was just really uh, interested to know your views vis-a-vis -vis Kenya as do you think that, two questions really, do you think that we will see a continued slow uh, opening of circulation in Kenya in the coming months? And secondly, what other steps do you think it's very important for the country to be taking? And then by extension, probably other, other countries in the continent. So do you think there'll be a, liber a continued progression? And, and what do you think the important steps are? And what, if anything, can the rest of us do to help with those? Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I think that uh, question is the most challenging question uh, one could ever uh, confront. And I, I, I guess that is what the political leaders are all dealing with. Uh, on one hand, um, coronavirus or COVID-19, as uh, scientifically called, uh, is a novel virus. So nothing is known about it. 
we can all talk about uh, people are contracting uh, uh, the virus and uh, recovering within 14 days, but nobody knows the impact that it has on the central or the core organs of the body, uh, the heart and the lungs, and there's a lot of debate now. That uncertainty is the problem with this virus, that uh, there is no certainty of the long-term impact of this health. So personally, I recommend caution because even in the bank, I'm only able to deal with the risk that I can quantify. Because if I quantify, I can be able to price it. None of us know and can quantify the impact uh, of coronavirus in, in its uh, absolute sense. And so we don't know what the long-term effect it will have on um, uh, the population. And the quality of a country's uh, capability is dependent on its people. It's the human asset. Uh, that determines how far a country uh, can go, both intellectual and health. Now, but however, having said that, populations are maintained also through livelihoods and economic opportunities. And shutdowns essentially takes away those opportunities. In a country like Kenya, your home, um, um, your mother country, where a significant portion of people live in the informal sector, or uh, the issue of you only eat if you work. So if we do a complete lockdown, then it means we have to feed the entire population. And that is where the challenge is. So it creates a very delicate uh, balancing act between livelihoods and health and stability, socio or what you could call uh, socioeconomic uh, stability. And uh, for Kenya, we have seen the government slowly after three months realizing we have locked people out, the economy is tanking, it is coming from 6% uh, to a prediction of 2%, a million jobs have been lost, uh, maintaining uh, livelihoods of a million people through safety nets is proving challenging because uh, the fiscal uh, uh, headroom is closing. So essentially what we have seen is that the curfew have been extended uh, from seven to nine. Uh, in the evening so that uh, maybe restaurants have been opened because restaurants and hotels provide maybe the highest number of um, livelihoods, either by the farmers who produce uh, to the hotels and hospitality industry, the people they employ, the people who feed, those have been opened. But what have we seen? Within a week, there has been a spark uh, on the infections and we have moved from an average rate of um, 200 infections we are now at 600 in just two weeks. And the question is trade off, uh, how do you do manage it? However, let me say the lockdown uh, that we had been there for quite some time has helped because every county now has 300 bed uh, uh, capacity uh, facilities to take care of the eventualities that come, but you don't want to lose life. So it's, it's really delicate uh, and it requires very precise analysis. Uh, to tell. However, that analysis can never be complete because we don't know how long this virus will be. My prediction is the virus is here with us for nearly three years uh, because we still have, don't have a vaccine. So the protocols that we have of social distancing, face masking, staying at home, uh, uh, washing our hearts, that will remain for quite some time. So Great. there is can be with us for three years. Let's hope it will be shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James. Teresa. Thank you. And now we're going to go to Barbara Mulwana from Uganda, who is chair of the Ugandan Manufacturers Association. Um, thank you, Teresa, and thank you, Africa.com, for putting this together. Um, mine is a very simple one, um, Dr. James Mwandi. As you know, my, your story mirrors my father, Mr. James Mwana, from the village to the boardroom. You also mentioned that your foundation started when equity was financially profitable. So in this human tragedy of COVID, as you called it, doctor, where people, businesses, families have lost a lot, what words and I think we're all here to, as uh, we're here to listen to you and to give us, what words would you give us to motivate all of us to keep those values that you were talking about from your mother, Grace, 
and also to, to keep giving and to make an impact. Thank, thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Barbara. A uh, very uh, timely question. Uh, my study of uh, pandemics over the last 1,200 years uh, reflects the human capacity to overcome. So I would like to give faith and hope that ultimately humanity will prevail over this virus. That's, uh, the question is how quickly can we be able to do that? This will require a very collaborative effort. Everybody's hearts must be on the deck of solving this problem. One, we must tame and contain the spread so that uh, that uh, is the biggest, so that is the public's responsibility. Uh, it's the issue of uh, the first line of defense for the entire of humanity is the individual taking responsibility. The second one, of course, we must uh, ask the government uh, to be the insurer of last resort. If the first line of defense is infringed, our government must assure us that we have medical capabilities and facilities uh, to be able to take care of us. So we must really focus on doctors. And for me, the appeal is that those who have medical knowledge, whether it's nurses, clinical officers, who have even retired, this is the opportunity for them to frontier, uh, to, be, to be on the front line to support um, uh, the, those uh, on business. However, for those of us uh, in society, this is the moment uh, to show our empathy. And as businesses, and I'm glad, uh, Barbara, you had uh, the association, I would really uh, uh, ask you to really seek uh, the private sector in Uganda to team up with the public sector to solve this problem. Uh, we will be as strong as the weakest link in, uh, uh, in society. And the weakest link at the moment is ailment of our people. So the best we can do is uh, like what Equity has done, uh, say a uh, profit uh, for the future, for today is saving our customers, as, they call, as we call them the members. The movement now is how do we preserve the rights of the members? How do we save the members? How do we protect the doctors? And I'm glad uh, I'm almost on sabbatical leave, uh, working with the medics on the front line. Just because I'm not a medic, providing them with the PPEs, I believe that's what all of us we can do. And collectively, nothing can beat us. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. And now we're going to go to Joe Alondo. Um, Joe, if you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. It's uh, wonderful to join this webinar from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, good to see you, Dr. Terry. I've uh, been a team member with the Equity Bank. I've been a staff, and I admire how you run things and your passion for the community. My question was, in your role now, uh, especially in the community and the team that is managing uh, the COVID response, how are you using your professional uh, skills to ensure equity, uh, not the bank, but equitable distribution of the PPEs across the country? Thank you, Dr. Tari. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, equitable uh, distribution here is very, very different, uh, Joe, because we are distributing PPEs uh, to all county hospitals uh, dealing with uh, uh, the COVID patients. So that brings equity. However, the volume of PPEs uh, delivered to a county hospital is based on the need of the hospital. We still have three counties uh, in this country without a COVID patient. Uh, so essentially, they just need basic PPEs that will allow them to handle the first patient when they walk in. But there are counties like Nairobi uh, with, let's say, 7,000 patients. That is where the epicenter of the crisis is. And that is where then, uh, the demand for PPEs. So equitability is determined by the patients you are handling, not the number of PPEs. Is what are the patients? And how many medical staff do you have uh, in a center uh, that uh, is dealing with the COVID? So it's proportionate to need as opposed to proportionate to number 
of counties the country has. But you can uh, know uh, that I come from equity, and equity is about <laughs> justice. Equity. It's equity. Very good. You know what it is. So that you, you can take it for granted. Thank you, Joe. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mwangi, for answering that question. We're now going to hear from Jack Nkuna, an executive calling in from South Africa. Jack? Hi, uh, Dr. James. It's very good to hear from you. Actually, very some, some interesting points you're raising there and uh, some wise words. Um, the question that I have for you is, which characteristics or attributes rank most highly for you in relation to sustaining businesses that can maintain their philanthropic activities? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. I think, uh, Joe, you have a huge opportunity at uh, the moment. The world is reallocating resources. And so, Joe, we, and we can argue this uh, offline, uh, this two, the pandemic is creating winners and losers. And so the, the Onus is on you to ask who, which sectors are turning out to be winners. As you heard, we are spending uh, 14 million dollars uh, to buy PPEs. So a business, for instance, that is in the uh, health and medical uh, sector is likely to be a winner as long as health uh, remains a main concern society. Food, uh, nutrition. Uh, for patients, what is most important to them is uh, uh, balanced nutrition and quality food. Again, that is a huge opportunity uh, to supply to the world and to the need uh, who require appropriate uh, nutrition. And of course, uh, we talked about education and said education must move uh, to online uh, uh, structures. Again, that is a huge opportunity. And for businesses, for least a particular equity, will not survive unless we digitize the, the entire bank. Our customers don't want to come to the banking halls. And the question is, how do we innovate? So when you look at that, uh, you really see the opportunity. In terms of outreach, uh, I think the question is, what are the big, uh, should be determined by the challenges of society? And say, this is the solution, the problem we we'll seek to partner with the society in Sobi. Okay. Hello? Yes, Teresa. Okay, good. I think we stuttered for just a second there. I apologize. I think my, my screen froze. Very good. Um, we're going to move on now to another question from Veronica Orej. Veronica? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mwangi. Very lovely to hear from you, your inspirational story. Um, so my question will take us back, slightly, will take us slightly behind. Uh, earlier on, when you are transforming equity building society into the giant that it is today, I mean, we can't for a moment think it was easy. So I just want you to share, you know, some of the biggest challenges you faced and, and how you overcame them. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Veronique. The first one, of course, the biggest challenge was public confidence. And needing uh, building societies whose image didn't give promise and hope uh, for the future would have been a difficult uh, a place for working customers. So the issue was uh, then uh, later, your personal uh, value system and credibility and personality as a guarantee to the institution, uh, such that uh, people at initially were not banking with the uh, equity building society, they were banking with James the person. It's the trust and the confidence that I could bring. So then, uh, but that would only start with the close friends and then uh, the community that knows you. So that was the biggest challenge. The second uh, biggest challenge, of course, are uh, being technically insolvent. And technical in, in, uh, insolvency, uh, Veronique meant having a capital of 1 million shillings and losses of 33 million shillings. So we are technically insolvent and a loan book of 9 million and deposits of 22 million shillings. That's how bad it was. So the question is, how do you use um, the little resources you have to meet the customer expectations 
uh, in terms of customer experience, while at the same time maintaining the infrastructure. Capital was a huge constraint. And if you look at the construct of um, equity to deal with the capital constraint, was then uh, we started paying staff uh, with the shares, 25% uh, of their salary. And I'm glad that was the best decision we ever made. Today, staff own 5% of uh, the entire bank. The second thing was appealing to the customers in what we called shared prosperity. When we became confident that uh, there was uh, light at the end of the tunnel, we asked uh, customers to uh, contribute a portion of their savings uh, into investment shares. And so essentially the biggest issue was to build trust. Uh, and with trust, we, then we used it as a currency to deal with the capital raising uh, to deal with the uh, confidence and loyalty of the employees into the future, a future. So my biggest responsibility was to paint the picture of the vision of the future in a breathable way. And the people invested in the future and that gave us um, momentum uh, to light the original challenge. And lastly, the biggest was regulation. Of course, a technically uh, insolvent building society that didn't comply with any of uh, uh, the prudential guidelines and the regulation framework. And so that required a lot of forbearance and tolerance. And if you look at uh, the book written by Professor Kahad Gott, uh, it says that um, the Central Bank of Kenya was the third factor to his uh, su uh, success, the rebirth of equity building society because of forbearance. So regulation was a big problem. Capital was a big problem. Trust was a big problem, and capability of uh, Brad was a big problem. Great. Um, I'm going to read our next question, which comes from Dr. Shiro. Dr. Shiro is a medical doctor in California, a Kenyan, very active in the diaspora, and chair of the Federation of, uh, I'm sorry, of Kenyan diasporan organizations, Kenyan diasporan organizations, Dr. Shiro chairs it. And her question to you, Dr. Mwangi, is how can the diaspora contribute to Kenya during COVID-19? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shiro. Uh, uh, the diaspora can uh, make a very significant contribution. One, uh, by supporting libraries. I think that is the most central. The biggest problem is the suffering of people because of lockdowns that have created shocks in economic societies, economic opportunities. So if uh, we all maintain our families, uh, that will be a big uh, investment. The second aspect is really looking at uh, social investment, particularly in education can we really support the transformation? That to me is the most uh, urgent um, uh, uh, opportunity uh, that uh, if we fixed, uh, could really address the, uh, the plight of the youth, the impatient youth. And lastly, uh, Shiro, uh, I'm on COVID uh, uh, crisis management uh, part. Uh, if the diaspora could support us uh, in terms of uh, financing, the needs particularly of the medics, the foreign trade, and the safety nets that uh, we are creating for uh, the, those who are hungry in our country. That will really be a, a, a long way. But let me pay tribute to the Kenyan diaspora uh, that uh, the month of, uh, of June had the highest remittances ever in the history of Kenya. So uh, I would say uh, uh, I take this opportunity to applaud you uh, to keep the rights of uh, your mother at, uh, on. That's an interesting, very interesting statistic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have another question that has been written in, and that is from Jerry Ifu, who asks the question, what can financial institutions like Equity Bank do um, uh, to help start, uh, to help SMEs keep afloat and survive during the pandemic? Financial institutions uh, could do a lot, maybe more than any other uh, sector, because if essentially uh, uh, the oxygen that uh, keeps enterprises alive is financing. And financing, uh, the banks play the intermediation law. So essentially we could uh, really do the bridging 
take from those who have excess and take to those who have deficit during this crisis uh, and take the risk of that uh, intermediation. However, for those who have borrowed, we must assess how long this crisis will be and give them a, a, a sort of a break, a repayment break, both of principal and uh, interest for the period of the crisis so that enterprises focus uh, on survival and recovery immediately the pandemic is over. It's only then that we can say we made a contribution uh, to ensure livelihoods are not wasted. If banks made the mix, make, uh, make the mistake of demanding repayment, then we'll make this crisis move much faster from a health crisis to an economic crisis. And if we do that, uh, it will fall back on the financial system because eventually it will be a financial crisis. So we can avert a financial crisis by supporting enterprises for the entire period. Not three months, not six months, it's the entire period of the shock. Very good. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our Q&A and I'm going to hand the microphone back over to Professor Carolyn Elkins. Carrie? Thank you so much, Teresa and James, for those just uh, such illuminating responses to all these questions. And, and we don't have much time, so I'm actually going to sort of ask just one last final question of you, if that's okay. And, and that is, um, you know, we've spent the last almost hour and a half talking about your, your incredible background, your experience in the private sector, your past chair of, of Kenya's Vision 2030, which we kind of skated over, but that was an extraordinary role. Um, in helping uh, the president to craft the economic vision for the for the country and, and integration between public and private partnership and of course now you're serving on the president's uh, task force for COVID and so I ask you this um, James what what final thoughts would you like to leave with our audience today much of this audience who has been inspired um, but also who really turn to leaders such as yourself and quite frankly you're unparalleled in so many ways to help guide us in our thinking on, on, on what we should be in doing, um, imagining, um, hoping for. So I leave you with the opportunity to offer us some final thoughts. Uh, my final thought is uh, that um, as a continent, uh, we are in a tipping point where we can collect our history. We can ensure that our future is not con a continuation of our past by doing things very differently. We can take advantage of this crisis and turn it into a massive opportunity for uh, the continent. The world must recalibrate. There is no better continent that is well positioned to lead the calibration than Africa. A youthful population, a uh, highly educated, uh, a population because of its youthful nature, a population that uh, at uh, the mean age of 18 has been born and brought up during the digital era, so the really digital survey. And uh, I believe we can learn with the opportunity that um, this cliff uh, of separating the past and the, uh, and the future, we can be the uh, shapers and uh, of the, that future. And in shaping that future, what we really need to do is to appeal to the power of one. In each of us lies amazing capability. And what we just need is to really power it with passion and uh, commitment and say, I will put my name uh, uh, on the table to make a difference. Collectively, we can make a big difference. That difference would require us, particularly, I'm glad that there's so much uh, uh, people from the diaspora, coaching and mentoring our youth so that we can combine their energy and uh, knowledge with the wisdom we have collected of our, our lives, of what works and what doesn't work. Our youth must not repeat the mistakes we have made over the last 65 years. Otherwise, we'll be timing as a continent on the same spot for another 70 years. 
we are timing because of the mistakes. So if we can do the coaching, the mentally, the investment in the youth that we could do. The last one is that each of us must uh, do what they can do to ensure as a continent we are able to feed ourselves. You cannot ever claim dignity and honor if you are not able to feed yourself. So transformation of agriculture must be central to all of us. 75% of our continent eggs are living uh, from uh, agriculture. If we transform agriculture, we we'll transform the lives and livelihoods uh, of our people. So let's talk about education, transformation of agriculture, and it has done, been done before, the agrarian, the green revolution. So let's do our revolution at a time and feed the world. The market is bigger than what we can. But in the process, we acquire our esteem and confidence uh, because of our uh, ability to feed ourselves. And esteem, confidence will be maybe what will prepare us to aim high. But at the moment, we still aim at feeding ourselves. We must have bigger dreams. We have, must have bigger aspirations. At independence, our aspirations was to overcome the three enemies of disease, hunger, and ignorance. 65 years later, we are struggling with those the three. Those really are micro dreams. We must get our children to dream big through innovations and refusing, completely refusing the life we have lived. James, thank you. I, I, I... Um, I'm sure I'm not alone to say this last hour and a half has been extraordinary in, extraordinary in, in, in its inspiration. Um, and the, I just, you know, as, as the audience did, saw the slide that, that Africa.com just had up. And, you know, in some ways we're also often reduced to our awards and our accolades. And, but those numbers speak for themselves, James, what you have accomplished with the foundation, um, the, the inspiration as you yourself are sort of self-described here in our conversation, a young boy from the village with no shoes to a leader who has truly transformed, uh, transformed lives and livelihoods. And I can't thank you enough for sharing your vision, your inspiration today, but also to send a message to us all where that power of one message resonates. And I know I myself will take that away from today and reflect on that in new and important ways. And that's thanks to you, James. So thank you for transforming my life today. And I suspect that many others feel the same way. And so I'd like to thank you for all of your time. I'd like to thank Teresa and Africa.com. And I will um, turn it back over to Teresa at this point. But again, James, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, uh, Talesa. It was a great honor and a privilege for me to have mm -hmm. to share the platform with you. The privilege is ours, and I certainly echo everything that Terry has said. I took a lot away from this conversation. Um, your wisdom and the wisdom of your mother. Um, there are many things that I learned, but there's one line in particular I know that I will be repeating very often, and that is that no enterprise is greater than its leader or is any better than its leader. And so that certainly pretends great things for any organization or enterprise that you lead, because that means that the sky is the limit when you are sitting in that leadership role. And it says a lot about um, many things that we could talk about, you know, in the United States, you know, we, we have some challenges um, and we always look to leadership. And so the point that you make is a very important one for enterprises, governments, nonprofits, Thank you so much. Thanks, and Carrie, thank you for the time that you have invested in developing today's program. I really appreciate both of you. My pleasure, Teresa. Thank you. I will close by thanking our sponsors, Standard Bank, again, our lead sponsor. We are very grateful for your support. We thank our silver sponsors, FSDH Group, Main One Cable out of Nigeria and the Trade and Development Bank. We thank Covington and we thank MasterCard. We thank all of our media sponsors who help to keep, make sure that we keep the messaging going with respect to this um, series of seminars. 
and all the names on this page have been tremendous partners and brothers and sisters in the media industry. Uh, so we thank all of you and we look to do more work with you going forward. Next week we bring to you what will be our 14th webinar. Um, we started this in the depths of April when the world seemed very different. The title of next week's session is Almost August. African COVID-19 cases are rapidly rising. Economic strategies, what now? We're going to be looking at revisiting some of the strategies, some of the thinking. Much of the thinking that took place around COVID-19 was when, uh, I should say much of the thinking in Africa was when the death toll and the cases were rising elsewhere in the world. But now that COVID-19 is taking a firm hold on the African continent, how does that change the thinking? And to help us think that through, we have two, three fantastic speakers next week, Acha Leke, the chairman of McKinsey and Company Africa, Dr. John Nkongasong, who is the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control, and Vera Songwe, who is the UN Undersecretary General and the ninth Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. So please join us again next week as we continue to explore themes and topics important to business leaders as we all navigate COVID-19 and its implications on the African continent. Thank you very much.